This podcast is a talk by Paul Bowen on the need for an anti-capitalist and environmentalist response to the Euro crisis. You'll find more audio on the WSM website at www.wsm.ie slash audio. My name is Paul Bowman. I'm a member of the Workers' Solidarity Movement. And the following talk is a version of the talk that I gave to the Rossport Solidarity Camp um, last June, June Bank holiday weekend. So I'm going to start by uh, looking at the scope of the talk that I'm about to give you. Um, I'd like to mention that I, I previously looked at the evolution of the, the mechanics of financial capitalism that were the proximate cause, not the ultimate cause, of the crisis in uh, an article called Financial Weapons of Mass Destruction, which is available online at the, the Workers' Solidarity Movement website. I then went on to look at the more underlying or more ultimate causes of the crisis at the, the global level um, in an article called the 1010 event. So this here, I'm gonna be looking at the more local dynamics of the crisis going on in the Eurozone. So by local, I don't just mean in Ireland. We share much of our situation with our friends in Greece, Portugal, and Spain, and further afield in Eastern Europe. And from a slightly different angle, but still also um, our, our comrades in the core itself. Should the Eurozone implode, it will likely lead to a global depression, so our quotes, local unquote story is really of interest to everyone. Um, and finally, we can't forget the xenophobic dimension of the crisis with increased hostility to, to quotes, non-European unquote migrants, the rise of neo-Nazi or um, rebranded Islamophobic parties and so on. So I'm going to raise a characterization of Europe as, as a moment of the, the internationalism of capital. Um, now that's a, a slightly paradoxical, if you like, um, idea. So in the, the late 19th century and the early 20th centuries, internationalism was an idea that was more associated with a left-wing or, or socialist project. Um, even cultural projects like Esperanto and so on were very strongly associated with left-wing or, or socialist movements. Um, in the eve of the First World War, um, the, the father of German social democracy, Karl Kautsky, wrote a piece where he, he foresaw the, the coming of the war, but he said he was looking to a stage beyond that where he could see the possibility of capitalism overcoming it's sort of then current colonial uh, inter-imperialist warring and a stage where economic links of trading between um, the European capitalist uh, powers would eventually lead to what he called this idea of super imperialism. Um, that the idea that the, the European powers would become so closely interrelated through trading that they would um, cease to uh, in relate to each other through war. So, two world wars and uh, a couple of revolutions later, capitalism actually adopts Kautsky's program of super imperialism. Um, again, through this idea that somehow economic development and interdependence um, can lead to a lasting peace. Um, that worked relatively well throughout. The, the trials and tribulations of most of the late 20th century. Now today in the early 21st century, it sees us at the first real major crisis point of, of the European project of a, of a capitalist internationalism. So re, how do people react to that crisis? Well, there's, there's been a couple of main reactions. First of all, there is the, the steady as she goes, neoliberal orthodoxy of going, there isn't a serious problem, all we need is, is more and greater austerity. That perspective is, is increasingly seen as bankrupt by, by all sides, really. So the, the two main oppositional reactions to, to the crisis of, of capitalist internationalism is, first of all, a rejection of internationalism. Um, people who want to retreat, into the nation state, you know, under the slogans of sovereignty or whatever. Um, and the left wing variants, that can be the vision of we can have social democracy in one country. Um, 
but of course there are right-wing variants of that as well. The other reaction is to try and maintain the internationalism of the European project, um, but to say, okay, if neoliberalism and austerity isn't working, then maybe we can uh, fix the situation with a new European-level Keynesianism. So, are either of these positions left-wing? I think that's very unclear. Um, neither of them are really anti-capitalist. The reduction of the argument about which way forward to, you know, what is the best strategy for renewed growth is entirely within the capitalist horizon. Um, because when we are talking about renewed growth, effectively, we're talking about restarting the engine of accumulation. And accumulation, as we know, is uh, what Marx called Moses and the prophets for capital. So the other thing, of course, that seems to have been forgotten in, in the last few years of the crisis um, is that this endless drive for growth uh, is destroying the planet. And for some reason, that uh, question appears to have disappeared entirely off the, uh, the mainstream debate about which way forward. So a quick summary of the Euro story. Um, just to remind ourselves what we're talking about. So in 1929, at the League of Nations, Gustav Stresemann uh, asked, raises a demand for a common European currency. Um, like most of the things about the, the League of Nations, everyone ignores it and forgets it. So Europe itself as a project is born in the ruins of World War II. Um, and of course, the, the disappearance of, of half of Europe behind the Iron Curtain um, and the, the recognition by the then newly emergent world super, capitalist superpower, the United States, that if something is not done to reconstruct Europe from the ruins, um, that the rest of Europe will, will quickly disappear uh, under Stalin's tanks as well. So Germany is occupied at the end of the war. And then the time comes that it's necessary to, to restore some kind of home rule to Western Germany um, and to withdraw the, the occupying forces. And France is not immediately willing to hand back the Ruhr. Now, the Ruhr is a region of Germany that is the, the, the big coal mining and iron and steel industrial heartland of Germany at the uh, it lies roughly between, it is bounded on the south by the river Ruhr, which runs roughly east-west and feeds into the Rhine, and to the north by the river Lippe, which equally runs east-west and feeds into the Rhine. And that, that region there, um, which now lies in, in the modern German Länder of uh, Nordrhein-Westfalen, is uh, the Ruhr, it's a very rich coal seam and has been the industrial heartland of Germany um, from the 19th century right up to the current day. Um, the Ruhr has been the, the source of battles before in the aftermath of the First World War um, due to defaults on, on the impossible reparations demanded by the Versailles Treaty. The France actually occupied the Ruhr in 1921, finally withdrawing in 1925, but that occupation had the result of, uh, of a a great sort of boost to um, right-wing forces and so on. So the problem of the war in the aftermath of World War II is eventually solved by this proposition to create a common uh, European level commons around coal and steel. So the European coal and steel community is created by the Treaty of Paris in 1951, which uh, to which signatories are France and Germany, of course, and also Italy and the Benelux countries of Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. Um, and that's really the, the birthplace of, of the, Europe, the whole European project institutionally is the, the European coal and steel community. Um, the French initially have an idea of, of, of uh, accompanying this with a European defense community and a European political community. Um, but that project is actually knocked back by the French Parliament. 
So because the, the political aspect is knocked back, um, the, the designers of the project, if you like, switch to a more economic route. Um, I was to say the, the Kalski model of building uh, commonality through, through trade links and through uh, combined economic growth. Um, but within this, the Germany and the Benelux countries are interested in expanding the, the idea from the coal and steel community to a more generalized common market. And that is eventually established by the Treaty of Rome in 1957, which is signed by the same countries, by France and Germany, Italy and the Benelux countries. Um, and as we discovered, this is a little detail of history. In 2007, it was revealed that, in fact, with the time of the signing of the Treaty of Rome, um, the, they had not had enough time to get the full treaty printed by the printers. So the document, the big sort of bound book thing that the people signed at the Treaty of Rome only had the frontispiece printed and the page with the signatures on. All the rest of the pages were blank. Um, so there's a, a little amusing symbolism, if you like, that the founding treaty of, of the European project was effectively people sitting down and signing a blank check. Um, we move on then to, at the same time the Treaty of Rome was created alongside the European coal and steel community, the European economic community, note the economic bit, um, and the European Atomic Agency community. In 65, the merger treaty merges the coal and steel community and the Euratom into the EEC. Um, in 1969, in the aftermath of, of the 1968 revolt, the European Commission calls for and a hate conference agrees, quotes, a greater coordination of economic policies and monetary cooperation. Um, and they set out to plan European Monetary Union for the end of the 1970s. In fact, the Werner Plan is produced in 1970, but the effects of the Vietnamese struggle against American imperialism smashes the post-world order with the collapse of the post-war monetary system, the, the, the Bretton Woods system collapses between 1971 73, followed by the oil shock, wild fluctuations of, of currencies in the 70s that follow, makes the plan completely impossible. However, after the, the neoliberal revolution, if you like, of Thatcher, Reagan, the Volcker shock, um, and chaos of the early 80s sort of settles down, um, the, thing, the, the project gets back on track in 1986 with a single European Act plans to create a single market by 92. It gets establishes the Doors Commission, which gets back to the European Monetary Union Pact and sets a new timetable. Uh, and the Lords Report of 89 lays out the stages. So by that stage, we're, we're, we're getting to lock in. The Maastricht Treaty of 92 actually locks everyone into the process. The European economic community now becomes the European community. It drops the economic aspect and makes it clear that it's, it's a reunited both economic and political uh, project. Um, and the Maastricht defines the final criteria for the, the euro. The euro then is finally adopted as a unit of account on the 1st of January 1999. And then on the 1st of January 2002, euro as money as cash replaces national cash within the eurozone that we now live in so that was how we got here in a timeline um but we now find ourselves in the european debt crisis sovereign debt crisis as it's sometimes called now there's two stories that are currently dominating the debate uh, around the causes of the crisis the first story, which is the official story that's still being pushed by the governments, including the Irish government, etc., runs a little bit like this. The creation of the euro created a single interest rate. This was much lower than the peripheral countries would have got on their own, so they got cheap money as a free ride. They borrowed madly, spent wildly on consumption rather than investing in productive capital creating local price and wage inflation, and now they are uncompetitive. They have endangered the whole Eurozone through their lazy spendthrift ways and must pay the price for their profligacy. 
Austerity will restore competitiveness and guard against moral hazard in future. That's the dominant story. The, the opposing story, the one that we see mostly in the media, runs a little bit like this. That at the time of the Euro creation, growth rates in the core were depressed due to German reunification, and growth was higher in the peripheries. Feeling secure from cross-border currency risk, investment from funds from the banks of the core flooded into the peripheries, seeking those higher growth rates, thus overturning overheating growth into asset and property bubbles. With the onset of the crisis, timid local comprador capitalist class governments rushed to make sure the core countries wouldn't shoulder the loss of their, um, their foolish investments by nationalizing the losses and turning them into sovereign debt. Um, and that is, that is the opposing story, if you like. Now, in terms of moral framing, you could say the question comes down to who's more at fault in a, a, a stupid loan, the, the lender or the borrower? Um, I'm not going to go into the moral aspect of things. I don't think that's particularly interesting. Um, but with, we need to make one or two comments about these two stories. Um, the first one is mainly about the, the first one, the dominant one, if you like. The notion that we all collectively, if you like, uh, borrowed equally um, is, of course, bullshit. It was, you know, in Ireland's situation, it was the developers, the capitalist class that borrowed these ridiculous amounts of money. Um, and ordinary people just borrowed what they needed to put a roof over their heads. So the other question is the, the notion of the cure the idea that austerity will restore competitiveness in peripheral economies. Um, what I would call the myth of structural reforms. Structural reforms is one of those nice economic euphemisms um, that in practice basically comes down to, to cutting wages um, and benefits. Um, the idea, the, the mistake here is to think that Comparing a high wages, high productivity economy with a low, like Germany, for example, with a low wages, low productivity country like Greece, the idea that somehow you could restore, you could make Greek workers competitive with German workers simply by cutting wages is a nonsense for the reason that obviously there is a cost to living and there's a, a level beneath which wages cannot sink and people still continue to feed themselves, still continue to, to reproduce themselves. Um, and that is why if the level difference in productivity is so high, um, without increasing physical productivity in the core, cutting wages is not going to make low productive workers competitive with uh, workers in much higher productivity countries like Germany. So that must be noted that the, the the dominant message of restoring competitivity through austerity uh, is a non is a non solution. The only thing that could raise productivity is actual investment of capital into uh, into plant, and that's not going to happen in the middle of an economy uh, spiraling into depression. So it's a non-starter. The next question is, be careful what you wish for. If we were going to be narrow-minded, vengeful, and petty, then we might wish that the right wing in Germany would get everything they wanted because it would destroy them. That is to say that if the peripheral or weaker economies are ejected from the euro, the euro will be much stronger, which means it will be much more expensive. The, the, um, the rate compared to other currencies in the world would go vastly up and which would make the German exports uncompetitive um, and basically destroy the German economy um, based as it is upon exports. So um, the very notion of creating, of reducing the euro to a core of uh, Germany, Austria, Netherlands, Finland, and whichever other the core countries that could make the grade would ultimately be totally destructive. The question then becomes, well, why would 
German capitalist class and their political representatives desire such a thing? Why would they desire something that would lead to their own destruction, effectively? It's a good question. I mean, on the one answer is ideological inertia, if you like. People have a tendency to believe their own bullshit, particularly if they've been spouting it for over half a, half a century. Uh, never underestimate the power of, of stupidity in human history. But we also have to understand, if we, we need, want to understand how people act, we have to understand how they see the world. And I think it's worth taking a pause to see how the good German, if you like, the, 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 the self-regarding, socially conservative, Christian Democrat voting German might see the world and might see the, the crisis from their perspective. Um, the good German recognizes the horror of the Third Reich, and his or her fiscal rectitude is motivated by preventing such a thing ever happening again. If inflation destroyed Weimar and brought Hitler to power, then the good German is against inflation at all costs. If Hitler was a Keynesian in his deficit spending, then the good German is against all deficit spending and Keynesianism as a whole. If Hitler believed in the primacy of political will over economic rectitude, then the good German insists that non-ideological, pragmatic politics must always be play second fiddle to following the imperatives of sound economic orthodoxy. Now, I make that point in order, not, not to say that that's, you know, obviously how all German Christian Democrats think or anything like that, but simply to make the point that some of the propaganda that we have seen in the peripheral countries, both in Ireland and in Greece and so on, against the current direction of the Eurozone and taking particular aim um, at the Germans and uh, at Angela Merkel, for example, seems to be a very popular target amongst both left and right all over Europe at the moment, is this, this notion of putting pictures of Merkel or Schäuble, the, the finance minister, in, pic, in Nazi uniforms, um, is simply a complete misunderstanding of the actual political dynamics of this struggle. Uh, it's a sort of thing that's guaranteed to resort to nationalist or racist stereotypes in the debate is not going to advance the debate at all, um, and it's just going to make uh, communication impossible, leading to a dialogue of the death. So that's why I made that point. Um, so having looked at the problems of ideological inertia and believing in your own orthodoxies, we also have to temper that with looking at people's short-term material interests, and it has to be said that on that level, the crisis up until now has been relatively good for Germany so far for a number of reasons. First of all, it depress, it in fact depresses the value of the euro, which is good for exports, and that's contrary to the orthodoxy, of course. Secondly, it gives uh, German state access to very cheap money. At the moment, uh, German bonds are actually uh, negative yields, which is to say that investors are that panicked by the situation that they're actually paying the German state to lend them money, which is a nice situation to be in. Um, the next point is that it prevents German investors, the banks that have lent the money into the peripheral zones, having to write down those losses. Um, and finally, it's uh, austerity. The practice of austerity in the peripheries does destroy productive capacity as well. Um, and finally, of course, bailout loans are made out of profit. So the, the material interests, if you like, are not currently in conflict with, with the ideological interests. That's starting to change at the moment because the latest figures um, in terms of European production are showing German exports falling. So that's starting to create a bit of a, an economic pressure. So it'll be interesting to see whether the change, if the pressures in short term interests change, whether that will have any impact at the ideological level. But anyway, moving back to the bigger picture. Um, which is, I 
shortly before making this talk, I, there was um, the English translation um, of a book from the, uh, the May 15th movement in Spain um, by a collective called the Observatorio Metropolitano called Crisis and Revolution in Europe. Um, was released, and um, I'd, some of what I am talking about today is is in dialogue with that text, or or in reaction to it in some ways. And they raise a slogan that um, it's not a crisis; it's a con. Now I have to say, in reaction to that, my view is that actually it's not a con; it genuinely is a crisis. That's not to say that there isn't. potential ways out of the crisis, but the fact that there is such struggle over which way out of the crisis and that most people don't know is itself a crisis. So if it is a crisis, what I would say, though, is it's not a dual crisis. Uh, several years ago, together with my comrades from the Free Association in Leeds, we theorized the crisis as a dual crisis of an economic crisis and an ecological crisis. I think on reflection, that framing is misleading, potentially misleading. I think the idea of, of separating the crisis into two, um, two separate crises, one economic, one environmental, has in practice allowed the left, who were never much good with environmental issues to start with, um, to advocate a stagist approach, which is to say, first we fix the economy, which is banging the jobs and growth, jobs and growth drum. And then, once we've done that, then we can get around to fixing the environment, maybe with a little bit of sustainable investment or whatever. Now, one of the main proposals that I'm putting forward in this talk is, number one, there is only one crisis. Let's say there's one world, one humanity, one system, one crisis, and it's not the crisis of neoliberalism or the crisis of austerity, it's the crisis of capitalism. Um, and in that sense, I think we're in a different position from the 1930s. The 1930s was a crisis of a world system, the crisis of colonialism and the gold standard. This time, I think we are really at the, the crisis of the system itself, the crisis of capitalism and both the environmental aspects and uh, the economic aspects of that are not separate, but in fact interrelated. Um, and I'm going to make a little bit of, or sketch out the beginnings of an argument why that is so. So having our cake and eating it, the, the relationship between commodities in, in the modern conventional sense, which is to say the energy materials such as oil and gas and the, the raw materials for production, including metals, um, and food, and so on. Having the West, through neoliberalism, the West really outsourced most of its production to China. Um, not deliberately, not particularly as a plan, at least in the outset, but that's, that is the end result of how things work, worked out. So having out, outsourced our production to China, the natural resources that we used to use in the West in that production that's now been relocated have to go there as well. But the problem is we haven't reduced our own intake of natural resources um, if, if the resources simply follow the production. That's to say we're trying to have our cake and eat it, if you like. We want the production, we want all the goods produced in China, etc., but we also want the raw materials that we used to use to produce them as well. Um, however, it does mean with globalization that our relative share of the, the global demand uh, of commodities is, is being reduced simply because the amount being consumed in China, Brazil, and other parts of the world is, is rising so much. So we see that being reflected in the prices of commodities. Um, oil prices, for example, are going up, not so much because supply is falling that fast, but just because the demand is rising faster than the supply. Um, now that we're in the economic crisis, the West is uh, trying to restore competitivity by, competi by devaluing their currencies. So the US devalues the dollar through quantitative easing. 
then the Europeans devalue the euro through through crisis. <laughs> Um, but these tit for tat cycles of devaluation may end up with with you know the rates between the dollar and the euro and the yen ending up more or less at the same relative levels, but relative to oil and the other commodities, in fact, they're going down. So the commodity prices are going up as a result of this attempt to devalue. Um, now, in our depressed state, that now means. Any sign of global recovery leads to a spike in the prices of industrial and food commodities. That pushes up inflation. Um, in certain situations, inflation can be a, a factor for growth, but only if there's enough workers' power to respond to the pressure of inflation by imposing wage rises. In our current situation, where we, we you know, workers' power is not developed at the moment enough to do that, then inflation just becomes uh, a, a real wages reduction, if you like, which in turn leads to uh, lower demand and a decline in growth again. So you have this, this problem of bumping along the bottom, if you like, this sawtooth effect that every time it looks like growth is going to start again, commodities go up and the reaction is an end to growth and then going back down. So economically, our relation to natural resources is is part of this economic problem as well. Um, now, yes, and on that 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 problem of fact of, of the lack of workers' power in the West at the moment, um, we need to make one comment on the the notion put forward by the the uh, European Social Democrats, if you like, of of a new Keynesian strategy for Europe is that it's putting the cart before the horse, if you like. It's, uh, it's confusing the, the effect for the cause. Keynesianism originally was a response to workers' power in the aftermath of, of two world wars uh, and in a, a closed, still colonial globe where um, industrial production was contained within the imperial powers and the rest of the colonial world was excluded um, from that. Now, so the idea, the notion of, of a Keynesianism that is not a response to workers' power, but that somehow provides a better standard of living to the workers without them having any power to impose it is a, is a question of, of cargo cult politics, if you like, uh, the cart without the horse. So in the absence of workers' power, inflation both continues to, to devalue accumulated wealth and reduce aggregate demand. Conventional neoliberal response is to up interest rates, slows growth, um, and we have this, this sawtooth problem of not, not managing to find the economic solution within the rules of the system so, and, the, and the current balances of power. So why can't we have investment in new green technologies to create a new cycle of uh, sustainable growth is, is the big slogan in certain quarters. Because of the way capitalism works, capitalism requires increased accumulation. Uh, and that means either we, you know, that can happen one of two ways, either through the same number of economic transactions and higher margins on each transaction, or the same margins per transaction, but an increased number of transactions. Um, in the simplistic terms, the, the effects of capitalist compet competition means that a general increase on margins, uh, on transactions, is not realistic. Basically, if you can compete away a margin, you will do. So the tendency, the, the long-term tendency with it when capitalism is, to, is for accumulation to involve increased transactions. Um, obviously, not all transactions are based on the exchange, you know, the circulation of material goods, but most of them still are. So, the tendency is, if you like, is to the production and consumption of more and more stuff. Um, green, the idea of a green technology would only work if the overall production was to reduce the amount of stuff produced, which would then reduce our, our call on non-renewable resources. Um, but that 
doesn't, you know, that would only work if we reduce the number of transactions, which means less money, less profit, and that's not compatible with the drivers for capitalist growth. So sustainable growth is either, it's either it's not growth, in which case it's not capitalist, um, or it's not sustainable. So it's a contradiction in terms, if you like. Um, so growth and the endless proliferation of increasingly obsolete commodities is not an efficient way of providing for human needs, um, of abolishing poverty. And this, I think, is, is the big message that we need to get across, is to decouple this notion that the struggle against poverty, that the struggle for a better standard of living for all workers around the world is tied to um, this demand for growth, for, for capitalist economic growth. So then, you know, the natural response, though, to, to that challenge is to say that, that surely at the moment austerity is the main enemy, you know, in terms of attack on working class people's standards of living, unemployment, increased poverty, etc. All of the indicators are going the wrong way, and that's down to austerity, and surely the main issue confronting us right here, right now, is to fight austerity. Um, well, that's true. I'm not saying we should lie down to austerity, but the question I'm raising is the demand for jobs and growth, the proper answer to austerity, to the proper answer to poverty and suffering. If capitalism is a problem, how can the answer be more capitalism? And this is, in fact, as an aside, is, is sort of the, the, the germ of truth within the austerian, the austerity slogan that if debt is a problem, more debt can't be the solution. If you replace debt with accumulation, then that slogan actually become, reflects a, you know, a certain truth of the situation. Um, money is debt, debt is money within the capitalist system. So the accumulation of profit is the accumulation of debt. So, you know, if accumulation was a problem, then more accumulation can't be the solution. If you phrase it like that, actually, I would agree that is true. So the problem that we're faced with it is a debate at the moment is very firmly framed as growth versus austerity. Uh, you can call it neoliberalism versus Keynesianism, but that's the, the, the two alternatives that we're faced with. From an anti-capitalist and environmentally uh, an environmentalist perspective, that's a really shit choice between more capitalism with more austerity or more capitalism with more growth. No one at all seems to be proposing less capitalism as an alternative. Um, and that, I guess, is what this talk is about and the challenge that we need to give ourselves because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. For me, every time I hear someone saying, we need more jobs and growth, I have the eerie feeling that I'm witnessing a form of demonic possession. It's like the speaker has been possessed by the spirit of capitalism, making use of their vocal cords to express that primal capitalist urge, more accumulation. Now, I'm not a defender of the immiseration theory of the worse the better, far from it, but I do ask myself that old Rabbi Hillel question, if not now, then when? Why must the question of breaking with capitalism be put off in the middle of the crisis? Surely the middle of the crisis is as good a time as any, if not better, to say, hang on, this shit isn't working. If the crisis of capitalism doesn't raise the question or possibility of making the break with capitalism, then what does? The stages response of, you know, step one, Keynesianism, step three, revolution, step two, question mark, it was rather like the, the South Park underpant gnomes stages theory of step one, collect underpants, step three, profit, and step two is the big question mark. I, I, I think for me, this is the leftist thing. All the left parties at the moment are saying, you know, step one, Keynesianism. And they're sort of, sure, our step three is, is revolution, but I don't see how we get from one to the other. So that, I think, is the big challenge for us is that we need an alternative to the alternative. Um, we have to go beyond the whole, if I wanted to go there, I wouldn't start from here politics and go, okay, we're here. Where can we go from here? And what direction is the direction that's actually going to get us closer to where we want to go rather than just, you know, sure, bring back the Celtic tiger, weren't things grand while that was all happening. 
So that really, in summary, that leads me to the, the second proposition of this talk. Um, if you remember, the first proposition was it's, there is only one crisis, that is to say the environmental crisis and the economic crisis are two aspects of the same single crisis of capitalism. The second point is that we need to end poverty and we need to end poverty by ending growth. That is to say that we're, not, we're neither for austerity nor for growth, but for an alternative to capitalism. Um, and for a long time, the left, you know, from the 19th century to the current day, has had this, this Faustian pact with capitalism, which was sort of at the basis of Keynesianism, that the needs of workers for progressive exit from poverty, for the rise of living standards, can be reconciled with the need for capital's accumulation. And for me, the crisis that we're in now means that that accommodation, um, that Faustian bargain, is less and less sustainable. Um, capitalism revolutionizing of productivity means that less of our work is required to produce the same amount of stuff, which is not a bad thing in itself, but it does mean that so long as we're continued we're harnessed to the continual um, process of accumulation. It means either that each time round that results in a crisis of unemployment or a new cycle of reinvestment and producing even more stuff. And that simply cannot go on forever. And I now think that we are at a position with globalization, with the spread of capitalism and industrial technology to, to all corners of the globe, that that crisis has come to a head and that now raising the demand uh, for just more jobs and more growth against capitalist austerity is, has become a reactionary demand and that therefore we need to get out there and we need to create an alternative to that alternative. This podcast is a talk by Paul Bowen on the need for an anti-capitalist and environmentalist response to the Euro crisis. You'll find more audio on the WSM website at www.wsm.ie audio.